I'm going to talk uh, here a bit about plant growth first, because I think uh, that makes more sense than talking about the variety selection. So uh, the first thing I would like to uh, point out that we do have some resource available for you that's easy to find. Uh, it is uh, our production guide. And the easiest way to do is to Google the dry bean production guide. And it is a booklet that is also available in printed form. Uh, there are a couple of, um, uh, of those booklets still available at some of the extension centers uh, and uh, possibly also with uh, the dry bean growers. So the easiest way is to Google that one. And within that booklet, there is a kind of on the web, uh, the resources available exactly the same as in the booklet. So what I'm going to talk about today is a, a little bit about the growth stages. So there is a table which uh, explains the growth stages indication and then uh, in words what it means and it uh, is available in the booklet on page 11 and 13. So let's kind of look at a few uh, things about plant growth and development. Of course, when you put the seed in the ground, it uh, needs a lot of water to swell and then the root starts to develop. So the first uh, part that uh, we kind of start seeing uh, coming out of the ground is that uh, crook of the, of the plant, which is a very sensitive stage. Um, because that part, um, the cotyledons are kind of still hidden into the ground. Uh, if we break off the plant at that particular point, then we uh, have a dead plant, basically. Sorry. So if we are looking at the plant development, uh, then we can also see that the first uh, leaves that come out are those cotyledons. Those are kind of the seed parts. And then the first uh, leaves that we see are the unifolias. And uh, kind of the picture on the right is a little easier to see the unifolias. And then we start to go to the first trifoliate. So the, we call it trifoliate because it uh, consists of three parts, but it is actually one leaf. So that is when we start transitioning in calling the growth stages V1. Now, I want to point out uh, one of the important things about uh, crop growth and development is that within the leaf axle, so that you had the stem and the leaves are meeting, there are two axillary buds. Here it says axillary buds. That's not only at the cotyledon stage, but it is also applying to the unifoliate leaves. So within uh, the leaf axle, there are two um, uh, axillary buds that if the growing dominant po point, which is number nine here, if that is uh, damaged either by hail, uh, deer, or, or even rabbits eat it, then what happens is those axillary buds start to grow. So going back to the first part, there is no bud or axillary buds in that part where the crook may um, be damaged. So if we have the cotyledons, we will have some growing points. So let's look at a few pictures. The first one which we are talking about is where uh, we see the crook stage. And again, for uh, those that are interested in land rolling, this will be a very uh, dangerous time to roll because if we damage this, uh, we damage the plants too much. So here we see the unifoliates and here the first trifoliates, that's the V1 stage. As the plant starts to develop, we see more leaves and we call each leaf the three together, a V stage. So in this picture, you can say, see one, two leaves is the V2. As the plant starts to grow bigger at certain point, uh, it starts to also develop that uh, bud and we start to see where the flowering starts to take place. So now we're transitioning from the vegetative into the reproductive phase. And the R1 phase is when the first blossom is anywhere open on the plant's node. Now, when we look at an individual plant, it is easy to see that blossom. It doesn't mean that all plants are exactly at the same stage. So you will see variability within the field. So you have to kind of take an average to get an average growth stage for the field. Now, after, of course, the pollination has taken place, we see the development of the pod. And in this case, in half an inch in pod at that first flower, will indicate that we have now moved into the R2, the beginning of the pod phase. R3 is when we see about 50% of the uh, plant has been uh, blooming. And then we are moving now to the, uh, to the formation of the pod. The pod starts to become bigger. And as you can see in this picture here on the bar on the right, this uh, pod is about three plus inches long. So 
that one is full pot is R4. And as you look at the next uh, slide, there is C, there is a swelling within the pod, and there we see the seed developing. So now we are starting to develop the seed in uh, R6, 50% of the seed is developed here. Then with R7 is an interesting uh, phase where we see that the pods are, for instance, with the, with the pinto bean, they start to show those stripes on the, the pods. And we see also that uh, they are fully developed. Now, at that point, we start to transition out to the maturity phase at uh, R8. We can see that uh, the lower leaves start to draw the, uh, the nutrients and the nitrogen towards the beans and they start to yellow. And mid maturity is 8.5 when we see that the older spots start to get that mature color. And then at R9, we see that 80% uh, of the pods are ripening and we've only seen uh, uh, maybe 30% of the leaves still on the plant. At that point, when most of the nutrients have gone to the seed, now the risk for uh, damage due to frost uh, is kind of uh, done. Now we have to kind of transition into the drying phase, as we can see, uh, ready to harvest is always uh, a few days later. Now, I want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, the types of beans we have. Now, we do have a type kind of a determinant bush bean, which means that it starts to flower all at the same time. That is not what we typically have in our region. We typically have the type two, which is uh, where we see there is vegetative growth taking place, but there is also flowering taking place. And if the conditions are well, you see even uh, flowering in the top part of the plant. But it is more of a bush. And most of the breeders have gone out towards a plant that is more erect that can be harvested straight. So we have gone more to a type two bean compared to the previous one, the type three beans, which is like a floppy bush. Uh, the older pinto beans, they kind of become big, they lay down and we have to kind of undercut them to do a good harvesting. And then on the right, you see an, uh, a climbing uh, bean, which is uh, more like the pod, the, the beans that are growing in the garden, the tall beans. So. Now I'm kind of transitioning into some of the uh, ideas about varieties, etc. So in North Dakota, I'm uh, putting down here the acres on the left and the years from uh, 2018 to 2021 20, uh, uh, on this graph. And we see that last year we had about 600,000 uh, acres. Now every year, um, and the issue in cooperation with North Harvest is doing a survey and that survey is just published, but I'm going to just highlight a few items that is, are of interest for our talk here. So this is based on the North Harvest uh, bean grower survey of this past year. And as you can see, uh, the majority of uh, beans grown in the North Harvest area is the Pinto, followed by the Black about uh, 18%. Kidney is more in Northwest Minnesota. So this is the North Harvest region is both North Dakota and Minnesota, and of course the Navy. So I'm gonna focus mostly on the Pinto, the Black and the Kidney. So first of all, I'm gonna talk here a little bit about uh, the Black Bean. So uh, the next couple of slides are kind of uh, in a similar uh, format. So I will explain how it is. So on the bottom, we see the years from 1990 to 2020. And this is data from the statistical service and each blue dot represent the North Dakota state average for black bean as reported by the statistical service. Now, as you can see, there is a lot of variability between uh, the years. Now, I also put down here a formula that is based on the trend line. And the trend line is kind of a mathematical way to express what a long-term trend is of the yields in the black bean. And if you look at that one, you can take that number and show that it is about a 12 pounds of increase in black bean from 1990 till basically the present. So that 12 pound increase is due basically due to an increase in management. That is what we're talking about today. And the second one is the genetics. The genetics has also improved. So we see the combination of management and genetics. Now you may say, well, what about the environment? Well, that is expressed in those blue dots. 
the blue dots is an environmental expression. And we can see that there is year to year quite a bit of difference in the potential of the beans based on rainfall and other events in that year. So now I'm looking here at the navy bean, basically the same setup from the years and the pounds per acre. And again, looking at the formula, we come to the conclusion that for navy beans, the yearly increase has been about 24 pounds per acre. And again, that is about half of it comes from management, half of genetics. We don't know exact breakdown, but it is uh, probably close. And again, in the blue dots vary due to the environment from year to year. Now, one of the factors that I'm talking about is that year effect. And just to kind of show you a couple of ideas about the weather influence, we also ask uh, in the harvest, uh, uh, not harvest grower survey, can you tell us what is your most limiting factor? And one of the factors is water damage. So in this case, it is talking about the percent of the fields that had water damage. So again, from 2012 to the last year, and we just look at, for instance, 2012, a dry year, and 2021, nobody reported uh, water excess because it was a drought year. But we have also a couple of years that are wet. So I'm just going to focus on 2019 just for an example. So now I'm looking at the pinto bean yield over the same period as we have looked at before, same format here. But now I'm going to focus on just some individual points. So we have one point and one point. So the 2012 was the dry year and the 2019 was the wet year. And it looks like the drier years tend to be higher yielding. And that is probably because we have less disease development in a drier year. Wet year, we have excess moisture, drown out, and we have lower yield. Now that uh, this graph would show that we have that 19 pounds of increase for the pinto bean. Now, of course, if we now add the last year, which is 2021, we see something kind of not so nice, and that is that it is way below the trend line. And what happened last year, we had drought the whole year, even starting from the year before. So the difference, like for instance, between 2012 when it was dry and it had a higher yield than the trend line, and now 2021, it has a lower yield, is partly due to that moisture availability in the soil. We were not having that water bank to draw from in our productivity. So you see that this past year, we have the lowest yields in uh, quite a while, and it is far below the trend line. Now, if we are uh, looking at uh, some other factors, I just wanted to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the study that I did, which also affect the yield, uh, but also the interpretation of our variety trial. So I did a study at Prosper, and I planted on May 18th of last year, and I planted on May 26th. I'm just going to kind of run down the season. So here is the rainfall for the Prosper. On the left, you see the rainfall in inches and on the bottom, the date. So the first uh, observation is that there was really no rainfall to uh, the time when I planted first on the 18th. So basically, I planted in dry dirt. And, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the plant needs some water to swell and start the process of germination. Now, after uh, the planting, we did have some rain, but it took a lot of rain to kind of fill up that profile. The second planting was taking place when the soil was already a little bit moist. So we have a second planting about two weeks later. So the effect was that if you look here at the plant population of the early planted on 18 May, we had uh, between uh, 84,000 and 85,000 plants per acre where if we went to the late planting, we had definitely a higher population. So the conditions were better the second time around, and we find that there was a higher population. Now, if you can translate that one in the year, what does that do to the yield? So here I had six and uh, six treatments. The blue bar is the early planted on May 18th, and the red bar is planted on May 26th. So I'm gonna focus really on the mean. So what ended up is that the early planting ended up to have a lower yield than the late planting. So that was an environmental, just a weak difference. And we see that there is a difference in yield just because of this 
dry conditions during the planting. Now, just kind of comparing this with some other years, I went to the same location. It is a little older data, but that is 2012. And here I'm looking at the planting dates early, a little bit later, and then in, May, in June. And you see the differences are not that big, but you see actually that the early planting was the highest. If we look at similar data from Carrington in 2012, the early planting date was higher than the late planting. So in other words, the, just the planting date will um, cause the crop potential to be different. And that also has then an effect on how, it, how your varieties will do in the field. So Carrington uh, has two types of trials. It has dry bean trials and it has irrigated trials. So every year, what we do is we combine all the data from all the sites in North Dakota in an extension bulletin. So the easiest way to find the variety results is to Google NDSU variety trial results, and then we can click on dry beans and we get to the page as shown here. And the trial information for dry beans is indicated on the right bar. You click there and we get a PDF. Now this PDF is also available in printed form at the REC's, the uh, regional center, as well as the uh, local extension office. So if you want a copy, they are available. But what do we find in some of those booklets is the data from several locations. And we always recommend look at some trends instead of looking at a single year. Uh, look at the averages over a few years, especially like last year was pretty dry. And we have on the bottom an LSD means the least significant difference. And I will give you an example in some of the slides coming. Last year, we had a little bit of a more variable yield level due to the drought. And sometimes that coefficient of variation is a bit higher. So if it is higher, you have to be a little bit more cautious in interpreting the data. This year, there is also another tool available, which uh, is available on the web. And the easiest way to find that one is to uh, type in vt.ag.ndsu.edu and you get to the tool. So I'm just going to give two or three slides here to show you what we have. So this is the, the URL. And then you have on the left all the variety uh, trial information by crop. And I'm going to just click on the dry bean and I get, for instance, here Langdon. So I'm just going to show you Langdon data. You click on the Langdon data and then you get specifically for Langdon. Now, the interesting thing about this particular tool is that on each column, variety, days to maturity, the yield, you can click on it and it will sort it high by low or light, uh, low by high, depending on what you want. So you can sort it uh, several ways. The other thing is we can chart some of the information and that chart for Langdon is indicated here. I uh, look at the yields, the two year yields and the three year yields. So here is the variety and you can see the yields over time. What I mentioned, you look at consistent varieties that do well over time. So here you actually can do some of the graphics of either uh, the yield or other factors that are mentioned into the table. Now, going back to the variety booklet, we uh, typically uh, give the name of the cultivar. We give some information about the relative maturity and the type of plant growth, as I mentioned, in my earlier slide, we are going mostly towards direct harvesting to an upright vine or a short vine. So in the survey that was just done in 2021, uh, there was a question of which variety are you using? So I posted here the Pinto varieties and that was based on 60,000 acres. So it is about 10% of the total acres uh, in North Dakota. Of course, some of those are uh, all the acres and pintos are less, but 60,000 acres. And we see the percent and the pinto variety as they were growing the past year. So here you can see that the top three on the left, Toreo, La Plaza, Monterey. I will show you the data of yield later. But an interesting thing in this graph is that we have two that are slow darkening, the vibrant and the radiant. And this was about 18% of the survey. So if you look at the slow darkening, you can see here a picture of the slow darkening. It is a more of a white looking bean. It has that characteristic that it slowly turns the color. And for consumers, they like that bright color on the shelf and like it uh, to buy it uh, as a, a very attractive bean. 
Now, we asked a couple of questions about the new darkening beans. So, uh, we asked the growers, are slow darkening pinto varieties a good alternative to the regular darkening pinto? And about 45 or 42 or 3 percent of the growers indicated that, yes, they feel there is potential for this particular. But you also see that about 50 percent said, no, we don't think it is going to be the future. So now I'm uh, also uh, asking, uh, would you grow it if there's more seed available? Well, that really did not make any difference. So the seed availability was not a factor in growing uh, slow darkening pintos or not. This uh, graph is kind of interesting to show what the sentiment is in the growth. So the question is, what are the main limitations for the increase of the slow darkening pinto production in the Northwest North Harvest? area, including Northwest Minnesota and North Dakota. So the number one is market price. So farmers feel that the price differential between the regular beans is not sufficient to, uh, them, for them to start growing. The second one is that the performance is still a little lagging. However, the other factors like the lack of markets, no, that's not an issue. Uh, is there uh, a benefit for the consumers? That's not the issue. So this really focusing on the market differentiation as well as the agronomy. So I'm going to go back now to a couple of observations about some of the varieties. This is the Pinto variety trial in irrigated in Carrington. So we have the variety, but also maturity. So I'm going to kind of look at uh, the bar here, maturity, and compare that with seed yield. Now, uh, oftentimes when we talk, for instance, with soybeans, if a plant is longer in the field, it intercepts more sunlight and we typically have a higher yield. But that's not always the case with, uh, with the pinto bean. So I looked here at irrigated data for two years. And on the left, you see the yields in percent of the mean of the trial. And on the bottom, you see maturity days after planting is days after planting when it matures. And actually you see a small trend that is not very strong, but a small trend that the later maturing did not harvest as, as well. However, if I just put more data together, this is a 12 year site, and I put the maturity days after planting and the yield, you see there is just a random scattering. So it is not as with our soybeans, where there is a direct nice correlation between uh, later maturing and higher yield. In this case, we see that it is a kind of a scattering of those uh, numbers. Um, looking at uh, some of the variety trials, uh, here is the 2021 over seven environment in NDSU trials. And I'm uh, pointing out that we have two uh, kind of uh, slow darkening in those. The next slide is kind of showing them from lowest yield to highest yield. And if you are uh, looking here at the num at the letters, when there is an A, that means all these with a similar letter, we could not statistically say that they are different. And this is over 25 environments, but the yields are increasing from the left to the right. And in this particular set, we have the two uh, slow darkening uh, types indicated in the white bars compared to the normal in the green bar. I'm going to quickly uh, finish up with uh, a couple of uh, statements about uh, the other two types, about the black and the white. So the black uh, uh, varieties uh, that were common over seven side years were Eclipse, the newer one, North Dakota Twilight and Blacktails. And they were basically in the similar bar par ballpark with ND Twilight a little higher. So one of the, the newer ones has a, uh, that is Twilight has a few advantages. So in fact, it actually is a few days earlier than Eclipse, but it also has resistance to being common mosaic vi virus as also to uh, uh, the resistance to the rust race uh, uh, that is available or that is in our region. So looking at uh, the Navy beans as a, a kind of a closing for today, we uh, looked here at uh, Navy beans over 18 environments over three years, and I'm going to focus kind of the summary slide here, looking at the average yield, and we can see that Blizzard, Medalist, and uh, the last uh, T9905 has uh, similar yield over all those environments. So in summary, 
the factors that influence uh, the variety results uh, are the planting date. And uh, we have the previous history of the bean inoculation, salt levels, excess water fertility level and drought. Those all influence how yields will perform under several conditions. Mm -hmm.